Hello and welcome to another edition of the High Desert Ranch and Homestead. This is Robert and I'm going to do a little bit different um, approach to a video. Um, it's part of a new series that I'm calling Robert's Food for Thought and in this case it literally will, will be talking about food. And it's what I'm about to present is something that I've thought about for a very long time and I I've seen a lot of trends and things. I love to study economics, um, commodities, uh, and the weather, and even a little bit of politics. Uh, not so much the, the back and forth mudslinging, but overall like economic policies and, and things of that nature. Plus, I'm just, I'm a student of history. So uh, bear with me. It's um, welcome to this channel too, by the way, if you've uh, never been on before, welcome. Uh, please like and subscribe and share this video. If you find this information pertinent, uh, please share it with like-minded individuals and those that uh, maybe just uh, look around and things just don't feel right to them. Hopefully the information that I'm going to share it will be helpful uh, for you. And um, as always, by the end of this presentation, I'm going to uh, go over some things that will help you to prepare for these um, perfect storms. Uh, because what I'm the, the trends that I've been seeing is there's always cycles in life, but in the last few years, especially in 2020, there's things that are just culminating or converging to really just set things up to to be to occur that we've never seen before in the history of this world. Like I said, I love studying history, and I've seen the rise and fall of empires. And um, I will say one thing: uh, the world, but more specifically, the United States of America. We have gone where no other country or empire has gone before. And so, um, kind of the old phrase, uh, bigger they are, the harder the fall. Well, that is so very true in this particular case. So, uh, I don't want to be uh, doom and gloom, but um, anyways, um, I'll just present to you the evidence and um, you do with it what you will. And... Um, hopefully it will open your eyes or continue to help accelerate or be a catalyst for a change and preparedness and helping to get things ordered in your life. Um, whether it be something huge economically or even simply the loss of a job or something like that. Um, but just be more prepared. There's always more room for preparedness. So with that being said, let's uh, move forward um, into something, uh, one of the first um, sections of this presentation and that is the drought. Um, per this map, um, you can see that uh, things are not good um, for the most part of the country. And um, it's been a growing um, trend as far as things getting even more worse, uh, as you can see here up in the High Plains. And even down in Texas um, and all throughout the Midwest where there's a lot of heavy agricultural uh, crop uh, development and growth, even up in Montana, um, a lot of wheat is grown. And um, I wish I had more time for this kind of stuff, but I'm going to include the links to all these maps and these resources so you can see it yourself. But um, I'm going to try and keep this short, 45 minutes, uh, no more, no less, um, just because there is so much to cover. But um, so this is just a general overview. Like I say, you can see Montana, the High Plains, uh, Midwest, down to Texas, where a lot of the nation's um, um, citrus, uh, wheat, grains, uh, other commodities, corn is grown, uh, cattle, livestock, uh, especially in the Inner Mountain West, there's a lot of uh, cattle. Uh, this is cattle country right here in Wyoming, and you can see this drought. Uh, Utah, some of the worst hit, Four Corners area, and even into California, uh, Central Valley, where there's a lot of citrus and other agricultural products that are uh, produced. And then uh, throughout the rest of the Intermountain West, you have a lot of cattle, uh, uh, cattle that run, and uh, even in eastern Idaho, too, as well, uh, not only cattle, but um, a lot of potatoes and other agriculture. So, um, these are the conditions as of as of March, and coming out of a winter, this is not a good sign to be seeing, uh, specifically, especially um, for for most of the country, but especially where a lot of the the food uh, is produced and raised. Um, so, just a little bit more of a 
of uh, drilling down and I'm more focusing on the West because that's where I'm from uh, depending on the response uh, I get in the comments I'm more than happy to do breakdown by other regions like I say this is something I love to study I've studied it my whole entire life um, as far as the weather and whatnot and agricultural uh, even more uh, in the last several years so right here is basically uh, data compared uh, year over year since 1981 so this is what we're looking at um, as of March 21st and you can see some of these percentages obviously the green is really good and then some of these colors up around the Seattle area northwest and uh, the yellow is not so great and then you see some of these red spots down in uh, New Mexico and e even Arizona that so this is 20 percent of the normal snowpack uh, so you have some of these places down in uh, Arizona the the White Mountains the Salt uh, River and a lot of these places don't have reservoirs or if they do they're extremely low and um, these x dots are represented by um, they're uh, not not being reported so even here for like the California Central Valley not looking great at all um, uh, things have improved uh, there was those two massive winter storms that came through so it's improved snowpack in places like Montana even Wyoming and the Front Range area uh, but some of the worst places that are hardest hit um, are still suffering greatly, such as Nevada, Utah, uh, Arizona, and even New Mexico. Uh, Utah actually is, in fact, uh, the worst drought um, levels in all 50 states of this country. So, um, another interesting thing that I thought was very startling, and I actually came upon this, it's um, even after all these years, you keep uh, stumbling upon these things, you really have to drilled deep onto some of these uh, websites uh, from the United States government uh, agencies. And this one was what I thought was very um, startling. I do have one for the Platte River, but again, I was trying to just narrow my focus and perhaps my general audience, like I say, I'm happy to do other, uh, depending on the regions of where you're at and the, the response I received. But um, here's the snow water equivalent in the Colorado um, headwaters. And as you can see, there's all these number of sites and all the different years. But really, the one thing to look at is this green line right here. And this is actually um, where like the median should be um, out of all these years. And uh, even like the median peak. And you can see we're coming up on that very fast. Uh, this is the first part of March. So really, we're more right in here. And they release these reports uh, bi-monthly. So... Um, Hopefully those numbers have gone up because of the recent snowstorms, but even here um, we can see that regardless of the snowpack or the snow melt, um, that's, uh, it's all going to be relative. And so right now is currently where we're at in 2021, and you can see we've been lagging, and especially as we start to go into these warmer uh, summer months, things are, are not looking good uh, for the Colorado River, which... Um, feeds into all these areas such as in Utah, but a majority of the water for the Colorado is allotted to places um, like California, parts of Nevada and Arizona, but a lot to, to uh, California. And so um, as we start going these hot summer months, um, this is something to really be concerned about. I don't know if any of you have driven by Lake Powell or Lake Mead. Um, super super low i've in fact um i had my sister she drove by lake powell um she sent me pictures she's never seen it that low before i was shocked at just how low it was i thought it was low a few years ago um, but it's not looking good as, um, especially after 2020 was one of the worst droughts um, i know in utah and arizona it was the hottest and driest on record um, ever in like 157 years of record keeping so um it's just something to, to look at. Uh, so we're definitely trailing behind even just the median uh, flow from the Colorado River. So uh, moving into more kind of uh, deeper uh, the regional drought, and you're going to see how all this affects. Um, that's why I said the perfect storm or lack thereof. It's just all these in things that are just happening. Now, there's always been droughts over time, but this is some of the worst droughts we've seen um, in the history of, of the record keeping. And so you can see um, that the, the USDA or um, NOAA actually categorizes in five different categories 
uh, from this yellow color all the way to this dark red amber burnt color to exceptional drought and you can see just how bad um, it is and again this is uh, it's been updated in um, February there was an update in March so I wasn't able to pull up for this um, presentation but things really haven't changed much and you can see states like Utah and Arizona are um, some of the hardest hit in New Mexico as well um, and even up here in Wyoming you have right here in the heart of cattle country uh, this extreme uh, extreme drought and then here's just a quick breakdown of percentages of states so basically in your worst categories of uh, extreme drought and exceptional drought exceptional being the worst 85 percent of the state of Arizona is uh, grouped into these two categories Colorado is 57 percent New Mexico 82 uh, Utah is the worst out of all states and that 90 percent um, and Wyoming isn't is faring a lot better um, but still in these very important parts of raising uh, cattle where a lot of the, the ranchers depend on that to grass to grow and even to raise uh, hay they get a shot at one cut um, from whatever mother nature provides they're at 23 percent but you need to keep that in mind too it's all relative to the area where the drought is the worst so uh, definitely not very encouraging and especially as we're coming into the spring um, and we're coming out of this winter period to have these kind of percentages doesn't uh, bode well um, something that I did notice that change is right in here in Utah kind of the, the spine of the state there's a lot of agriculture and farming and ranching communities uh, that actually went from exceptional drought to extreme drought so a little bit of an improvement there but not too much and then again looking down here in Arizona uh, you have the White Mountain Range and then the Salt River um, things haven't got worse but they haven't got better as we're coming into the March category and then quickly, uh, the Beehive State Breakdown. Um, again, focusing on what I was just talking about earlier, because um, I feel that quite a bit of my audience is from the state of Utah. Here's something I thought was very interesting. You can see, uh, starting one year ago, all the different drought conditions and their percentages. And you can see as the months have got on, starting basically at the pandemic, start of this uh, quote-unquote pandemic last year in March, uh, things have just become worse ever since. Um, and the most uh, frightening one are these some of these more extreme categories where things are just, they're not necessarily getting worse. And in some cases, they are getting better, uh, especially in this exceptional category because of all the heavy snowfall and uh, precipitation that's fallen in uh, this part of the state, which happens to be some of the the highest uh, agricultural outputs in the in the state of Utah. So um, again, I'll go ahead and put some links so you can look at some of these other states and see this breakdown. But uh, that's really the nitty gritty, just to kind of show you how bad things have become. And something that is even more interesting as part of the this be uh, the the state of Utah's drought conditions is um, something that I've noticed is it went from short term to long term drought which that, um, that's a hydrology problem, that it's not just a, a surface, that it's actually gone very deep and it's gonna take a lot to recover from this. And similar to the Colorado River headwaters, here's a soil saturation and this green line is where we should be. This is the median over the last 40 years. And this black line is where we're at currently. So um, as you can see, there's a huge, um, percent saturation difference uh, right now and um, I'll be curious to see what the the next report is here uh, in just the next few days but if um, my guess is it will have improved because of all the precipitation that's uh, the state of Utah has received but it's still going to be a far cry from where we should be and then just to correlate with that is um, the groundwater conditions you can see the groundwater drought which is um, huge as far as uh, agricultural uh, irrigation and wells for farmers and for small homesteads and just a surface drought it's um, you can see from January 2020 uh, 20 to now February we are so much worse off than what we were from a year ago um, so 
A Tale of Two Regions. I thought this was very interesting. Uh, a very similar thing to the state of Utah, but it's more of a regional breakdown. Um, and I'm comparing the the West, Intermountain West, and the High Plains. Again, for the sake of time, I just couldn't do the um, a whole bunch of regions, but I'm happy to do so um, if if needs be. Uh, you can see that uh, <clears throat> one year ago there was over half of the West and more than 80% of the high plains that had no sort of drought conditions, but you can see that uh, that has now dropped to just above 12% in the high plains and just above 10% in the west with some of the um, hardest hit regions again in the intermountain west. So uh, some things to be a, a little bit troubling again as we start to go in these summer months, especially in the high plains uh, where there's a lot of wheat commodities grown, um, uh, corn, uh, grains, and uh, cattle that are run, especially in Colorado and uh, Wyoming. So, so um, something that I thought was very interesting too was um, these. Let me just fix that. Okay. Um, some reports I heard last year uh, about rising food prices. Uh, some experts say upwards of 400% by 2023, 2024. And while that may sound crazy, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I found this graphic and I thought it was, um, didn't make that seem too far-fetched, this whole 400%. Um, as you can see, these staples from, uh, they're comparing it to prices back in 2014, 2016, which I'll get into later on in this video. That was also time of a lot of economic uncertainty, some of the outports and imports, um, commodity prices, they were rather high. But as you can see, as compared to now, um, March 20, 2020, compared to uh, February of this year, uh, things like vegetable oils have skyrocketed, um, cereals, which we see for like a lot of our grains to make bread, and um, just food in general has gone up. Dairy, um, sugar um, is on par, but um, it's going to continue to trend. Meat took a hit um, because of the 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 virus and that was shutting down processing plants so now a lot of um we've seen a lot in the recent months of just people trying to get a, a rid of their surplus um stock because the longer they hold on to those animals whether it be cattle or pork um, it continues to cost them more so they're just trying to offload their inventory um so um just an interesting graphic right here. And then this graphic by category, um, which I'll come back to, it's um, basically you're looking at the, the the percentages of expenditures by U.S. household. And something I thought was very interesting was food was um, third behind housing and transportation. And as we've seen now because of rising um, fuel prices and even uh, food costs, um, this 13% will probably surpass transportation. Um, if it already hasn't, I need to find a newer graphic for that. Uh, but uh, something just to keep in mind as we go further into this presentation. Um, you know, oh, and one more thing that I want to add to was um, something that if you haven't noticed already, but in 2021 alone, and from just January to now March, is that um, the the fuel prices have already gone up in most of the country by 35%. And for every one cent of price increase or price decrease in fuel, adds cost the economy of the United States an extra one billion dollars. So the fact that, um, um, like for here example in Utah, um, I was paying right around 2.25 a gallon. Now it's about three three dollars and thirty cents. That's over a dollar. So that's hundreds of billions of dollars. That it's now cost the economy, and that is of course not being absorbed by the rich folk, but it's being passed upon to the average day consumer in the poor households. So um, again, this whole um, rising food prices um, that was talked about in twenty twenty, it's definitely not out of the realm of possibility. Um, so just to cover also, too, uh, speaking of storms, uh, these recent storms that we've had, uh, the Arctic chill that we saw in late February, early March, and then again, Azalea that came through, uh, swept the high plains in Wyoming, Colorado. 
Um, just some of the agricultural losses that we've seen with that uh, cold Arctic outbreak. Um, as you can see, Texas had hundreds of millions of dollars lost in citrus, uh, which in livestock and vegetable crops. Uh, and when you think about Texas as a supplier of agricultural products and citrus, they're huge. I mean, it's not only a big state, but they're a huge economic agricultural contributor um, as far as that. So to see these kind of losses and not to even get into some of these other losses, uh, such as Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, there was a huge um, hit to the crops that were planted. There's basically three uh, growing seasons in these states. And so when the farmers planted back in November and December, and even January, they weren't expected to get hit with this record-breaking cold temperatures. And the fact that it wasn't just for a short period of time, but it was over the course of several days. Um, I saw photos out of Louisiana that looked like where I live in Utah. And that was after uh, several days that there was still snow on the ground. So um, we're talking losses in the billions of dollars as far as agriculturally. Um, and this is just something that, uh, again, it's, um, it's, it's compounding upon the problems that we already saw from last year. Um, and even globally, when you look at globally, um, there's these, um, and it kind of goes right along with that earlier graphic where it shows vegetable oil prices going up. And even if you've uh, bought an olive oil recently, you've noticed this, even at places like Costco, Sam's Club, where you get good quality olive oil or vegetable oil. Um, those prices have gone up almost 50 to 100 percent in some cases, and here's why: there's um, because of just the, the changes in in the climate and things like that, natural changes in climate, not man-made. Um, that there's these viruses that are affecting these trees and these families that have uh, um, extracted olive oil for generations. Uh, they're in peril of losing their entire entire livelihood, and so um, as you can see, this. Uh, could cost over 20 billion uh, euros uh, because of these viruses that are infecting these trees. As some have put it, it's the, the coronavirus of all of trees. It's really just devastating um, these, these crops, these trees that are in these countries. And uh, it's been going on for a few years, but it's gotten even worse uh, over the last year or so. Um, and speaking of 2019, um, or excuse me, 2020, uh, something that got very little coverage and yet it's going to have a huge impact and we're already seeing that impact here in uh, 2021 is uh, the the derecho storm in places like Iowa um, that uh, that were completely devastated the corn crops they were basically um, harp doing twice as much work for half the harvest just to try and salvage what they could and uh, so we saw a no plant 2019 that um, because of all the storms and whatnot, farmers couldn't plant till late 2019. And even then they didn't get as much. And of course, because of that, they didn't have as much time pre to prepare for 2020. So when they did plant, um, a lot of these farmers, such as in Illinois and Iowa, um, they got hammered with these um, summer storms that just completely devastated tens of millions of acres of crops. And because of the virus, race riots and the, the election, uh, a lot of this was just kind of glazed over. Um, and even in 2019, there wasn't a lot of talk about this no plant 2019. And yet the, the USDA continued to have very um, sunny Purdue, um, pun intended, gave very sunny forecast for um, these, um, these agricultural outputs. And yet they weren't as rosy as he made them out to seem. And also, I put this here with China because I'm going to be talking about that. China um saw flooding that they've not seen in a very long time in fact there was worry that a lot of these dams were going to break because of just the huge amount of not only headwater coming down from the himalayas and the tibetan plateau but just all the torrential rain that was falling so coupled out with the the um, lockdowns of of the coronavirus in china along with all this massive flooding uh, china by the time they were able to um, come out of all this uh, in 2020, they struggled to even get people back out in the field because, for many reasons, fear of the virus and um, other economic conditions. And so, um, and they're also coming out of the uh, 
uh, the African swine flu, it has also devastated their hog, uh, the hog industry in China. And so China is trying to rebuild their, their, their hog herds. And of course, because of they've been hit so hard um, agriculturally because of all the, A, the drought that they had in 28, 2019, but then the heavy rains and flooding in 2020. Um, they've not only been buying huge, importing huge amounts of grain and things of corn, but they're going to be expanding even more so and buying more and more of the grains and other commodities such as corn um, and rice just to be able to not only feed their population, but to try and recover uh, economically um, for, with these swine herds as they try and rebuild. And of course, that's going to drive up the the price of of all the worldwide commodities just because of what the efforts of China. And so um be quite interesting to see just because of the fact that um in places like the Soviet Union, which is the highest exporter of wheat, is putting a double tax. Putin just announced a double tax uh, a few weeks ago on wheat and because they're trying to control um their inflation in their country and so is these these countries like Russia and then even Argentina and Brazil, they're putting um, limits on their exports just because of the own pro their own problems that they're having in this country. Plus, uh, last year in South America, they had a lot of problems with the weather, uh, which lowered the agricultural output. And so their their own governments are looking to um, help stabilize their economy and feed their own country uh, people in their own countries. In India, same story. In fact. Um, there's a lot of farmers that are committing suicide because the government's restricting the exports and keeping things within the country, which means the farmers aren't a even able to meet um, um, and cover their own costs of, of, of their input costs to produce um, whatever it is they are producing. So a lot of troubling things. I haven't heard any – America has not put any plans to export. Um, we're obviously large exporters of wheat right behind the Russians, or as I like to call them, the Soviets. <laughs> To use that old term, nothing's to really change much with that country. Um, but the fact that, uh, um, and this is dovetails perfectly with this slide right here, is not only with the Arctic weather in late February, early March, but then it's almost as if that wasn't enough. Zylia came along, that's how you pronounce it. Um, the winter storm came along and dumped um, a couple feet to uh, 12, 6 to 12 inches in the high plains, which um, you know, these areas get that kind of storm uh, quite often, maybe not um, to that extent in one snowstorm. But the fact that all what you have to understand is this winter wheat that was planted last year, it can take <clears throat> the dip in temperatures, especially the extremely cold temperatures. But these temperatures that we had in February and March were so cold that the wheat as it's growing can't handle that freeze thaw and especially that deep freeze that we saw in February and March. And so it'll be really curious to see the the wheat that um, the only way we'll be able to tell is just it's a wait and see game um, as this wheat continues to green up just what impacts that these storms had um, there in the high plains of, of the Midwest. Um, so uh, again, going back to all these countries are limiting their exports or taxing it very heavily and China who's trying to rebuild um, not only their swine herds, swine, hog, pig, whatever you'd like to call them, they're trying to rebuild their herds. Um, and they're going away from a more, um, their what has been their traditional feed to stuff like corn and wheat and some other grains. And so they're going to be buying as much as they can. Um, and that's not just a projection. They've announced that they are making plans to do such. So again, it's just a wait and see game, but my gut tells me from what I've studied and some of the early reports coming in that the, the wheat isn't looking, uh, the wheat output isn't going to be looking very good for the winter wheat here in the U.S. Um, and speaking of corn, something that, um, again, has been happening for uh, quite a few years now is this corn that's not grown for human consumption. And it's this whole ethanol madness, which I've never been a fan of. Um, it's It's just... Government cronyism is at its worst, subsidies at its worst, just every, you know, the quintessential definition of a government program that shouldn't even be around, that's just costing so much. And uh, some things that I hide right here was 
Um, the cultivation of corn for ethanol now requires a staggering 38 million acres of land, an area larger than the state of Illinois. Um, so, <clears throat> and then I didn't underline this, but uh, by comparison, the total of cropland used to produce grains and vegetables that humans eat is only about twice that acreage. So, in other words, the U.S. devotes enough land to corn ethanol production to feed um, 150 million people. So, while initially the whole idea was, oh, let's go greener and let's produce our, you know, stop depending on foreign oil. But as you see in the last few years, and especially under the Trump administration, um, we became the, the number one uh, ex, um, exporter of fuel in, in the entire world, completely um, self-sufficient as far as when it came to, to fossil fuels, uh, natural gas and uh, oil. However, with this corn, uh, it's it's a mandatory thing that the government requires, and a whole bunch of gas stations, as they go to replace their equipment, have to put in this more expensive pumps so that can pump the ethanol that's in the gasoline mixture, usually about a 10% mixture. And um, something else I highlighted, highlighted down here was few Americans realize that to subsidize corn ethanol production, they're paying almost twice as much for ground beef as they did before the this subsidy was created uh, back in the early 2000s. And also the supermarket price of both flour and rice jumped about 50% after this was created and never fell back. That's something I realized when I first got married. Um, and even before that, I have some um, some siblings and family members who are very prepared. They noticed the, the jump, and I didn't understand why until I started looking more into the corn ethanols. And right here is exactly why. And so this ethanol program functions as a hidden food tax, the most regressive of all taxes. And isn't that the truth? And so um, just a staggering statistic is that also, too, is that $50 billion a year of taxpayer money goes to subsidize uh, this, this corn ethanol, this corn that's grown not even for human consumption. And in the most recent uh, stimulus bill, uh, there was more subsidies given to these corn uh, farmers and the producers of the ethanol. So it's just, it's absolute madness that um, we, you know, as we're starting to see, we've had these shortfalls in the, the corn uh, harvest in the last couple of years. And now all these other countries are going to be hunting for as much um, grains as they can, uh, hence why they've tried to stop as much export from their own countries as they can. Um, they're going to be, they're going to be searching for corn and especially, uh, um, a place like China as well, they're going to be looking for corn, not only for their hog um, population they're rebuilding, but also their population in general. And now they're even announced that they're trying to get into the cattle market. Traditionally, they haven't been a large um, producer of cattle, but they're planning on uh, getting into that business as well. So um, just something to consider that uh, it's just... Again, another another thing that just is adding to this uh, perfect storm of, of of chaos, whatever you want to call it. And in recent news, we've heard a lot about uh, oil pipelines. Excuse me, got to wet my whistle. Is that um, these oil pipelines um, not only going to have an immediate impact on oil production and the cost of oil, which no surprise, like I said, we've seen. Prices already go up 35 percent, um, and who knows? We haven't even hit the summertime when generally prices really go up because there's a lot more people moving out and about. And if current trends continue with all the lockdowns easing across the nation, uh, we're going to see quite a few people traveling, and I don't even want to know what prices are going to be. Um, but the oil pipeline that you heard a lot about was the Keystone Pipeline that ran from Canada all the way down to uh, the Gulf of Mexico excuse me, Texas area. One that didn't get a lot of mention was the Dakota Access Pipeline, which I thought was very interesting, but it's twofold. A, it's going to obviously impact oil, but the fact that in um, both these cases of pipeline, it's going to be transported by rail, which makes absolutely no sense to me. Rail or truck uh, makes absolutely no sense from an environmental perspective, but it does when you think about crony capitalism. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Warren Buffett bought out uh, um, the Burlington Northern and Santa Fe rail lines uh, several years ago, and uh, surprise, surprise, um, he's uh, the one to take the place of the oil transport. He's going to profit very much 
um, from this oil transportation deal. And it tried to happen under Obama and it got shut down because of the um, the outcry or the, the media attention, but nothing's being said about it now. So, but regardless, um, this Dakota Access Pipeline, you can see from this map where it traverses and it travels through the High Plains, Iowa and Illinois. And if you know anything about agriculture, you're looking at grains, um, wheat and corn is a huge and um, uh, soybeans is a huge amount that's grown in these states. And um, they a lot of them use rail to transport. And so uh, agricultural economists say that shutting down the Dakota pipeline would cost corn farmers just in Iowa and Illinois alone. We're not even talking about all the other grains and wheats over one billion in avenue annual revenue and quote drive up food prices for consumers as oil would now take precedence on railroads to transport grains and the, these roads need to transport grains, wheat, and corn over long distances. So, again, if you're looking at a bushel of corn or something of that nature, I don't know the, the current price right now. Let's just say 150. Um, you're going to see a huge increase because of now you can no longer put it onto um, some sort of hopper car or something on the railroad where they can transport, you know, 80,000 pounds of corn, grain, or wheat at one time. You're going to have to put that on a truck and um, anyone knows that when you're tran <coughs> if you can transport by rail across land, that is the most e effective and efficient means of transporting large amounts of of anything. So again, it's not only going to see higher oil prices. We've already seen that, but um, there's a lot of farmers that are already worried that um, now what is that going to mean for their their exports, and are they even going to be able to transport everything that they grow, or are we going to see the fact that um, are they going to alter their uh, what they do plant or what they're planning on planting because of because of the the shortage of access to to railroad cars to be able to transport. So, um, and then also too uh, uh, moving a little bit more to the economics on a national scale as far as uh, fiscal policy. Um, if any of you have got on to the uh, um, the the United States, uh, there's the debt calculator. Um, it's like debtcalculator.org. Either way, I'll put it in the link below. Um, this ticking, uh, the ticking debt time bomb, it's out of control. As you can see, over the last uh, basically decade, we've just, it's just been steadily growing. And uh, every other year or so, we hit these debt ceilings and we just continue to climb higher. Um, <clears throat> we hit the debt ceiling early in 2019. And people, it was unprecedented, 22 million. And as you can see at the start of this uh, um, virus lockdowns here in the United States, and it has gone just about 23.5 million, and it's just gone completely out of control. Um, just, it's this whole um, modern economic, um, modern monetary uh, theory of just, oh, you can just print as much money with no consequences, but uh, um, it's, it's basic economics 101 that the more money you pr print, the less uh, value it's going to carry. And again, this whole who bought the extra 4.5 trillion added in one year, it's just <clears throat> incredible. And um, it's not China um, <laughs> and it's not the Fed or basically a banking cartel. Um, it's a lot of these other countries, but a lot of other countries too, are, um, along with China, they're decreasing their holdings as far as buying up the, the U.S. debt. So I think they were starting to see the writing on the wall. And when you start to see this kind of spending, eventually the market can no longer be artificially propped up. You're going to see that inflation that I believe we're already seeing with the cost of goods. It's not just simple supply and demand, although that plays into it, but you're seeing um, food inflation um, in, in other household goods. You're seeing... Uh, and eventually that's going to turn into hyperinflation. Hyperinflation happens overnight. We're not there yet. It's We're seeing that inflation increase. <clears throat> so. so all this translates um, into higher feed costs and other inputs. And um, as I kind of talked about before, um, China has become uh, the largest importer of corn. And 
it's because of the swine flu that they they lost just huge amounts. They're trying to rebuild that. Um, and here's a statistic right here that China is going to continue to import and to go from basically one percent to to eight eight point three percent, I believe. Uh, 2018, 2019, they were right around 3%. So they're going to more than double their amount of imports that they're going to be bringing into their country. And again, that's just going to add to the overall cost of, of these commodities because the supply is not only being dwindled, and it has been dwindled over the last two years, 2019, 2020, but 2021 isn't looking any better. And it's simple economics. There's less, so there's the, the price is going to be even higher. Um, and this translates to higher input costs for farmers, whether you're looking to, you're at a feedlot for your beef or your your pork industry and even the poultry. Because of these higher input costs, um, farmers, ranchers, and uh, contract uh, suppliers of, of meat, they're going to be looking at ways to reduce their overall costs, which will either, uh, they're going to be purchasing less uh, animals, whether it be um uh, steers, uh, pigs, and even poultry. We're already actually seeing that. There's been smaller production, especially after last year. 2019 wasn't great for the livestock industry. 2020 is going to be even worse. Um, they got hammered with the whole coronavirus. And then 2021, um, they're just, they're they're trying to rebuild from all that and even get something that's, um, get ahead of the game. But because of these higher input costs, uh, they're trying to look for ways to to minimize all that, which would be in the form of either purchasing less uh, animals up front or not feeding them as much. So they're going to, as these trucks come in to pick up the cattle, uh, the, the pigs and the chickens, the, everything is going to weigh less. So there's going to be less amount of overall uh, pounds hitting the market for consumers to buy. But yet the prices are either going to stay the same or even go up because of a, um, all these extra fuel costs. Uh, to transport these animals um, from the processors and from the processors to the <clears throat> to the consumers at supermarkets. So I'm running out of time. So luckily I'm at the last uh, one. Of, what's that? And what can you do to prepare? Um, so I've I've covered a lot of information. Hopefully you've found some for um, some of this useful. I'm I'm trying not to be an alarmist, but put just the 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 facts uh, in front of you. To, to let you decide what you need to do. But what can you do pre to prepare? Well, I would suggest um, to prepare uh, like a 30-day meal plan and then take that 30-day meal plan of things you want to eat, things you do eat, um, and then to create like a three-month meal plan. And that way you can just say, okay, um, here's everything that needs to go in these meals for 30 days. This is what we need to buy at the grocery store. And then just multiply that by three. Um, not so much related, but it's always, I think, good um, from what I've talked about is to have fresh water. Um, do you have uh, water barrels? Do you have water bottles with filters that can filter however many gallons? It just depends on the, the kind you buy. Um, even water bobs, your tubs are great, especially for natural disasters or if the water is contaminated. Um, and even just remember... If you hear something like that, uh, shut off the your main water uh, down in your basement or whatever, so at least your water won't be contaminated with the rest. And you can at least have the water that's in your water tank or fill up your tub and then turn off your water main. Uh, and something, too, is uh, learn to barter for your skills, trades, um, your skills and trade. Um, barter with food, even livestock that you may have. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, the dollar is just a simple bartering tool, but as you can see, and I didn't have time to get into, that's quickly going to become devalued more than it already has. Um, so if you have a lot of cash on hand, I'm not telling you what to do, but just keep in mind, um, if inflation goes up, you know, 200% in the next few years, you just lost half the value of the money that you had stored under the mattress. So um, that definitely is going to come in handy, these, these skills of bartering and trading and uh, learn to grow your own food. Speaking of food, uh, <clears throat> start a garden today. There's plenty of uh, places. It's the perfect time of year. There's classes being offered um, all all throughout. I'm getting emails all the time for these garden classes and that are specific to your area. There's a lot of people out there that would love to share what they know um, because where I live is going to be different from where you live. And so just start that. Start a grow box. Some, do something on the balcony. Just 
I mean, if you've got just a small balcony, just pack it full of pots to be able to plant food in. Just start somewhere somehow. Um, the good Lord will recognize that and he'll help and he'll provide. Um, if you have an empty lot, talk to somebody about possibly turning that into a neighborhood garden. Uh, do something. Um, and while gardening, learn how to grow with those heirloom and open pollinated seeds. Um, a lot of the seeds, uh, unfortunately, they're they're made so that uh, they're one and done. But um, we got to get back to the way our forefathers, pioneer ancestors did things. Um, and so uh, you'll go back to the whole um, um, the, the whole Punnett squares or however you call it of just learning how to cross pollinate and get the best and save the best of each harvest to um, perpetuate into the future as far as growing more uh, for your garden. <clears throat> Speaking of extra uh, of those fuel prices going up, like I say, I've already seen a 35% increase um, by those containers to store extra fuel. Uh, the whole buy low, fill, fill, fill it up, top it off while it's high, and then replenish when the, the price dips. Um, even if it's just 5, 15, 20 gallons, if you run a bigger agricultural operation, um, while the prices have gone up, they're going to continue to go up. So if you can fill up that 500,000 gallon tank, uh, just keep in mind that the price have already gone up where I'm at, a dollar. And we could easily see another two to possibly even another three dollar increase. I've heard reports of um, by summertime prices hitting four or five dollars a gallon, especially for diesel. So if you can buy that tank of gas and fill up that thousand dollar, a thousand gallon or 500 gallon tank, you're going to be Glad that you did if you can afford to do it versus waiting when it's going to cost uh, triple that amount just to fill up that same tank. And consider alternative energy sources um, for cooking solar ovens. Um, get that wood pile uh, stocked up um, and dried out so you can be able to cook and even heat your home in solar panels. Um, I would just, I would definitely look into something like that, even if you can't provide power for your whole house. Um, do it for part of it just to keep those energy costs low. Um, and especially if you can get something that's, and if you need to borrow for that, uh, those solar panels, uh, try and get a fixed rate. That way when um, uh, interest rates do rise, which they are, um, speaking of which, um, that's going to be a lot better to lock in a fixed rate now than because uh, in a year or so when the prices do go up, uh, you're going to be grateful that you did because you're going to be saving a lot more money. And then lastly is get out of debt where possible. <clears throat> um, I love the, the quote of, no man is truly free who is in financial bondage. Think what you do when you run in debt, said Ben, uh, ben Franklin, Benjamin Franklin. It says, uh, you give power to another over your liberty. And I love that. And uh, in, in Old Testament passages, say it, it says, Elisha said, pay thy debt and live. So get out of debt, especially credit card. Um, the variable rates right now are fairly low. I mean, it's all relative, 15 16%. But that could easily double soon, which it is. And if you can refinance, do so now. I've already noticed the rates are starting to go up. And we basically reached a point, folks, that the the Federal Reserve, this private banking cartel, as I like to call them, they've ran out of tools in their toolbox. They can, they're can they at a point now where they can no longer <clears throat> keep the rates low. They're starting to creep back up. And um, eventually it's going to get to the point where they're going to have to raise the interest rates just to keep the because of this this inflation that's already it's just naturally starting to come into play um they're gonna have to raise the rates just to to help try and compensate for that because like i say there's there's nothing else that they have left to do so um, definitely get those credit cards paid off that way you have that you don't have that debt any longer cut them up and then start working on any of these other things a, a, a three-month meal plan or a monthly meal plan and buying extra fuel um, and when you do have that monthly meal plan, that little food storage, um, and hopefully prices do go down, but even then, um, wait for them to go on sale. It's all relative. So again, it's that whole buy, buy low and use that up while the price are high and then wait for prices to dip again, whether it's at a, at a case lot sale or something of that nature. So, um, <clears throat> that's the end of my presentation. I hope that you've loved it. I've tried to keep it uh, to 45. I'm coming up on the 50 minute mark, but please like and subscribe. Um, I'll try and um, put out some great videos, hopefully that you can glean information from. Um, please share this with like-minded folks. Get the word out there. Um, and 
remember i love this picture i took this uh, picture here at my home and it was just after a late spring um, snowstorm we saw it, and i love because after every storm comes the sun and in this case a beautiful rainbow but the only way to make it through that storm is to be prepared and um, i love living by that motto if you're prepared you shall not fear and isn't that the truth and so um um, I appreciate you coming along for this and that you, if you made it to the very end of this presentation, God bless you. And uh, thanks for coming along. And I hope we helped you to escape the ordinary and see what um, it is like to live the high life here in the Intermountain West on the High Desert Ranch in Homestead.